Well, um, if you're just here for the first time, you've caught us in a, in a three-sermon uh, three, uh, series that we've done for the Easter season, and the, re- the, the Resurrection Sunday is today. Um, we've been looking at the biblical feasts in the Old Testament of what, uh, what, what the Old Testament feasts actually signify and how they point us to Christ. And so, for today, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 23. And so, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me as we have the reading of the Word this morning, as we do uh, customarily. Please stand, and I'll be reading from Leviticus chapter 23 and verses 9 through 14. And and afterward, I'll go ahead and say this is the Word of the Lord, because that's what it is. This is not the Word of man. This is the Word of God. And if you would please just join us in saying, thanks be to God, because we do want to be thankful that God made sure to get his message and his word to us. So this is God's word as being read from Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 9. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it be ten, ten, um, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Um, It's been a joy to be able to look into the Old Testament and specifically into the festivals of the Old Testament to see how these particular religious observances, this uh, religious observance of, of the people of Israel, their, their religious calendar, actually was instituted by God Himself in order to help, help them understand that He was doing a work in the world. He was doing a saving work. And so we've been able to see how these uh, Old Testament, how the Old Testament really points so clearly to Christ. Some people struggle with that. Because when we talk about the Old Testament, um, it seems to be like a different time in the world's history and different world events going on and different events in the life of Israel. But really, the New Testament and the writers of the New Testament so clearly say how the Old Testament is all about Jesus. In fact, um, Jesus says it himself multiple times. Let me read Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 44 and 45. We've, We've mentioned this before in the past. It says, then he said to them, these are my words, Jesus is speaking, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. There are things in the Old Testament, those three parts of the Old Testament, the law, the prophet, and the the Psalms, that, that, that must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand what was in the scriptures. He says something very similar in early on in his ministry, Matthew 5, he says, do not, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I haven't come to get, get rid of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, another way of saying the scriptures of the Old, of the Old Testament. He says, no, 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 I have come to, not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. There's things in, inside of them that need to be fulfilled. I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. In fact, let me add one more that hasn't been read yet. Jesus, if you've noticed, he said the law and the prophets and the Psalms. In this Matthew 5, he says the law and the prophets. He's just getting shorter with his words. John 5, he's just going to say the scriptures now. Uh, Verse 39, he's actually rebuking uh, the Pharisees at the time, the religious leaders, for wrongly uh, using the scriptures. But look what he says about them. He says, you search the scriptures because... You think that in them you have eternal life, meaning you think that because you know the Scripture so well that you can, you can place your own salvation on your own knowledge. He's like, actually, you, you're missing it. He says, uh, as it is, they bear witness about me. The Scriptures bear witness about Christ. And he's saying, you care too much about memorizing them in such a way that you're actually missing me. 
you don't know them all that well, do you? They're all about me. And so, as we've mentioned before in, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, the, the Apostle Paul points to the fact that there are parts of the Old Testament that ha- have shadowy uh, parts to them, meaning they, they're in, in the shadows, they're pointing to something, a deeper meaning. Uh, he says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or, or a Sabbath, or with regard, to, I'm sorry, with regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. That, that was the Jewish way of talking about the calendar, the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbath. For these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is Christ. So we've looked now at, at Passover, the first of the feasts. Uh, that was uh, in, in the springtime. And we saw how basically the Passover points completely to Christ, and it points to His death. First of all, it points to the fact that there needed to be a lamb that was slain as a substitute, and that substitute, now the people of Israel would not die because of their sinfulness. No, God would pass over their sinfulness because there was blood of a lamb that was taken in substitute for them, and it had to be a perfect lamb without spot or blemish. That points to Christ. Uh, Also in there, that that, um, as a part of this, you could not have your life saved unless you believed God's Word and obeys God's word. So what he, what he called to do in the Passover, he said, call all the people to partake in this, in this Passover meal. Why? Because if you don't partake in this, then you don't have salvation. And that's how it is with Christ. If you do not believe in Christ and do not have faith in Christ, you will not have salvation. That is true back then, and that's true for us today. It's only by faith in Christ, and so we must believe in Him. He is the one that we are to participate in. It also talked about him not having any broken bones. The lamb didn't have any broken bones. And this was something to be remembered uh, forever. And that's what Jesus set up in the Passover meal. He actually, he he showed that he is now the Passover lamb and he set up the Lord's Supper, which we'll be taking later. So we've actually, as a Christian church, been uh, doing this remembrance for the last 2,000 years because we're following Jesus' words. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. Then we saw on Good Friday that Not only that, the second of the festivals, that Jesus is the uh, unleavened bread. There was a feast of unleavened bread. It was very much connected to Passover. And in a similar way that there needed to be a spotless lamb, there needs to be bread without leaven or bread without sin. Sin, Leaven often meant sin. So Christ was our sinless bread. It shows everywhere that he was without sin. He He didn't know sin. He didn't do sin. He was without sin. Not only that, in the festival, God set up the, the, the festival so that the people of God would clean out their houses. They would take all week and they would remove any bread or th- anything with yeast because that represented sin. And it said, your house needs to get clean. And that's actually exactly what Jesus did on the last week before he got crucified. In fact, during the exact same season of Passover and unleavened bread, what did he do? Jesus cleansed his own house, the house of the temple of God, showing that he's fulfilling this festival of, of unleavened bread. Uh, also, in, in the setting up of the Lord's Supper, he says, this is my, he, he takes the unleavened bread that they would have been taking, he says, this is my body. He literally says, this is me, and it's broken for you, showing that the unleavened bread in, in the ceremony, ceremonial meal is pointing directly to Jesus needing to be crucified and his body broken. Not only that, because Christ is the unleavened bread, we, any who partake in Him, any who have faith in Him, we then must be unleavened as well. We must be called to be holy and righteous as He is holy. Well, let's see for our, our morning today. We're going to see the third festival, and I'm excited to do this. We're going to be looking at the festival of the first fruits, the third of the festivals that we're going to be looking at. The festival of the f- first fruits. So we'll be asking this morning, in what ways does the person and the work of Christ fulfill this festival, the festival of first fruits? And so let me just start off by asking you, isn't it true that when you think of something first, that that usually means something of significance, right? I mean, we could just think of a few things that were first that were significant. I mean, if I were to say George Washington, you would say he was the first president, right? Uh, if, If I were to say the Wright brothers, they were the first first flight, right? Or if I were to say, how about Charles Lindbergh? First to cross Atlantic. Um, how about Jackie Robinson? African American man. In, how about Neil Armstrong? First man to walk the moon. Is it first, first actually means something. How about Adam and Eve? First man. Isn't it true that when we talk about first, that it usually means something significant in history? The first, 
matters, right? Well, we're going to be talking about the first fruits, and God sets up this festival of first fruits, and it, it's, it's talking about something that really matters to God. It's not just true for us, it's true for God. He sets it up that way. In fact, um, we're going to see that how the first fruits is actually a festival where God wants us to thank Him, or the Israelites at the time, to thank Him that He provided for them. Right? The first fruits was when they would take up a, a sheaf or a bundle of the very first of the crops. In fact, it was in the spring, and it was often the crop that, that came up first was the barley crop. And so, the, as they sowed the seed, and they were waited, and they watered, they, after they planted, and they watered, they were waiting for the first sprouts to come up. And God set it up in such a way that when those first uh, seeds were sprouted, and they came up and ready for harvest, He said, I want the very first to be given back to me as, as an offering of thankfulness and as an offering of trust and as an, uh, knowing that I am the one who's giving you this. I am the one who's providing for you. And, and it just shows you a little token of what it looks like to take the very first and, and give it back to me saying, we love you, God. We thank you, God. We're, we're so grateful that you provide all of our needs. Let me read, starting in verse uh, uh, Leviticus 23, starting in verse 9, how this comes out here, how God commands this. Verse 9, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I will give you, even already noticing that God is going to give the people of Israel land, meaning he's gracious. He's provi- he, he already took them out of Exodus. He saved them from the tyranny of, of, of slavery. Now he's going to give them a whole new land. And what is this God's gracious provision? Well, look, uh, when you come in and into the land that I'm going to give you and reap its harvests, God is the one who gave you the opportunity to have that harvest. You shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. In verse 11, and you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. So God sets up this festival as a way to help his people understand that God is gracious. God is giving them life. He's giving them land. He's giving them food. He's giving them everything you need. And he's basically telling them, you need to know that you need me. And so let me set it up this way so that every year at the beginning, you could take your first and, and you could wave it, bring it to the priest and then wave it, showing this is for you, Lord. We trust you. We love you. We're grateful for you. In fact, it's going to go on to say that they could not even eat of their harvest at all until they did this first waving of the first fruits. That's very important. It's like saying, this harvest actually doesn't belong to you. It's actually my harvest, and I'm not going to let you eat of it until you acknowledge where it came from. Isn't that true that in in parenting, maybe you've been aware that Children need training, don't they? Children need to be told and need to be given manners, don't they, right? Isn't it true that sometimes if you see children who don't have manners and they just do things and take things and without asking, without saying please, without saying thank you, isn't it true that that can get a little bit irritating sometimes? Just like, mm, somebody needs to train that, train that boy, train that girl, right? Well, that's basically part of what God was doing to his people. He was training them to understand that they did not have life by themselves that they, everything that they were given, their land, their people, their food, their, everything was from God. And before you, you even enjoy it, remember to say thanks. Remember to know where it came from. He's actually helping them to worship Him. Well, and not only that, uh, it wasn't just the first, but it actually needed to be the best. Let me read from Exodus chapter 23 and verse 19. It, it wasn't, just, wasn't just the first, it was the best. Look what it says. The best of your first fruits, of the first fruits of your ground, shall, you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. In fact, if you're familiar with the, the story of Cain and Abel, this is very likely what was going on in the very beginning. That uh, Cain and Abel, the, the two brothers of Adam and Eve, when they came to give their, their offering to the Lord, one was acceptable and one was not acceptable. Abel's was acceptable and Cain's was not. In part, if you look at the wording that was going on there, it says clearly that Abel was the one who gave of the fat portions of his first flock, the first of his flock. It was the first and it was the fat, the best. You know what I mean? Like marbled steak or lamb chop. It was the best. But Cain wasn't that way. Cain was the one who gave some of the fruit that he had. 
It wasn't the first. It wasn't the best. And it's kind of like Cain was taking care of himself first and not honoring God as being the good provider and holding things for himself. This is what first fruits was about, the first and the best acknowledging God. Well, as we start to look at how does the first fruits festival get fulfilled by Christ, basically there's going to be one main point with a bunch of examples. So if you're writing notes, you could write this. It's pretty simple. We're asking the question, in what ways does the person and the work of Christ fulfill the, first, uh, the feast of first fruits? It's this. It's that the feast of first fruits points to the resurrection of Christ Jesus. The feast is actually all about new life from death life springing forth new. It's all about the resurrection, and it points directly to Jesus. In fact, let me start off by saying we could see that God is going to, when he sends Jesus to to earth to be able to do this work on behalf of, of humanity, we have to know that God first sent Adam to be able to live a life right, have family, but that, but that life was meant to be on God's terms for God's purposes. Well, what would happen in the garden? Adam and Eve, our first parents, they sinned against God by going against His command. They did not follow His law, and so what happened? They got cursed. Well, from that point forward, all of humanity is under a curse because all of humanity has sinned. That's still true to this day, but the good news of, of Jesus Christ in the gospel is that God the Father sent God the Son to be able, Jesus, to be able to be a new Adam, a new humanity, a new start, and this new Adam was going to be different. In fact, we see this happening in the, in the baptism of Jesus. Look at how God is sending kind of his first and his best. Um, Matthew chapter 3, in verse 16 through 17, we see this a narration about the baptism. And it says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, this is the Holy Spirit now, descending like a dove and coming to rest on Jesus, the second person. This is actually a great picture of the Trinity. And it says, And behold, a voice from heaven. Whose voice? The Father. How do we know that? Because look what he says. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry on which Jesus would then be an acceptable offering to the, to the Father. And what is it? It's, it's, it's the best. It's, this is my Son with whom I'm pleased. Look at how God himself, through Jesus, and Jesus himself offers himself. In fact, we see that uh, Jesus is not only, he's called, he's not only the best, he is the best, but he's called the firstborn. Uh, in Colossians 1, uh, for 15 and 18. Look at this. It says, he is, the fir- he is the image of the invisible God, Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is first. He is best. He's not, he wasn't a created thing. Let's make that clear because all things were made through him. No, no, no. He is firstborn in the sense that he is the highest. He is the highest in rank. He wasn't made. He was with God forever. Um, but then look what it says in verse 18. He wasn't just the first and highest in rank. Um, of of all things because he's God, but he's also the first of another sort. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The feast of first fruits, we're going to see so clearly, is, is a picture of God giving his first and his best in order to make a new type of human, literally, to make a new human race on earth. Because we have one human race on earth, which is all those people who are in Adam, all those people who belong to Adam, which, by the way, is everyone. If you are here, if anybody who's ever lived, it's because they can somehow trace back their lineage to Adam. Well, that's the first humanity. But we know that that humanity got corrupted. We know that that humanity is sinful and desperately wicked and broken. Um, You don't have to be very long with the person to be able to just ask a few questions about how are the, how's their life doing. Let's just go through the Ten Commandments. Oh, um, are, are you worshiping God and God alone with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Have you worshiped Him according to the ways that He commands us to? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain or uh, done things to disrespect His person or His work or His word? Have you ever not kept the Sabbath? How about, uh, you know, father and mother? Have you ever disrespected them? How about uh, anger in your heart? Jesus talks about if you've been angry with a person, you've committed murder, right? Lust. We could just go on and on and on. Every single person is in Adam, and every single person is desperately needy 
to be forgiven of their sins. That's why we need a new humanity. Well, Jesus is the firstborn of a new humanity, a a risen humanity, a resurrected humanity. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says that clearly. It says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits. There it is. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking about making uh, the first fruits. He's intentionally connecting the festival and first fruits offering to Christ. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first fruits of those who have been resurrected to a new type of life. It says, For by a man came death, by a man has, also, has come also the resurrection of the dead. In fact, as we even stop a little bit and think about harvest, if you think about harvest, it was built in. This is how God is so great. I mean, He builds into the created order, particularly even to crops, to plants, this idea of death to life, from nothing, new life. In fact, there needs to, in order to get new life, there must be death. Look, look what Jesus says about this so clearly in John chapter 12, that there needs to be a movement from death to life, and he uses seeds, kernels, crops as an example to show that. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This idea of first fruits and crops and yields and harvest, actually embedded within it is this idea of from the seed, the seed needs to stop being a seed. It needs to actually die to its seedness, if we could say it that way, and then sprout a new life. It needs to die and then begin something new in order to have a, a yield, a harvest. And so first fruits has actually always been pointing to this concept of death and life, death and life, God giving newness of life through death. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, same in the same chapter, talks a lot about this. In fact, people struggle to understand what this is. But he's going to talk about how this new humanity, which, are, which, by the way, is Christians. Christians are a new type of human race. And that sounds weird, but it, it actually is biblical. Um, we're a new type of human race because we're of a different type of seed. We are of the seed of Christ. We are of the seed of resurrection. Let me show you how, how Apostle Paul talks about it in that way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 35, he says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? And what kind of body do they come? Like, what does that mean that dead people are raised? Like, what kind of body do they come? Notice he says, verse 36, You foolish people, what you sow does not come to life until it dies. He has the same concept. First death, then life. And he says, And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for human, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. He's talking about the different types of bodies, the different types of flesh, different types of life there is. In verse 40, it says, There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from stars in glory. Verse 42, so it is with the resurrection. You guys are asking about how does this resurrection, how does this new life thing work? He's like, there's all kinds of different life, right? And there's, but they're, they're different in a very significant way. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. Meaning, this is the, all those who are in Adam have been perished, who are perishing. They're corrupted. They've been corrupt. And what is raised is imperishable. There's literally a new type of humanity because the old humanity was corruptible. The old humanity was able to fall in sin and be uh, condemned to judgment forever. But the new humanity, the ones who have been risen from the dead, like Jesus, can no longer be corrupted. They can live a different kind of life. They, can be, they are imperishable. He says, verse 43, he goes back and forth between the old and the new. The old and the new. And he says, what is risen is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. He keeps going. Look at verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And notice the contrast. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. It's true that Adam had life, he was, he was, but Christ gives life. Adam has life, and he lost it. Christ has life, and he gives it. You see the difference? And so it says, but it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. But what about the second? The second man is from heaven. And let's look at these last two verses. It says, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we are born in the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Jesus was the first human to be risen from the dead and to never die again. There were people in the past, we see accounts from from the Bible that there were people who were risen from the dead. Lazarus is a well-known one. Christ rose him from the dead. But guess what? He was risen from the dead so that he ultimately died again. His body was not changed to a different sort of body. It was still corrupted. Yeah, God, Jesus graciously extended his life, but he needed a different kind of life. He needed an eternal life, not a corruptible, sin-filled life. No, 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 a faith-filled, humble Christ life, the one that Christ came to bring. So Christ is the new human, the new Adam, the beginning of a new humanity, of a new body, a heavenly person with a heavenly body that cannot be corrupted. Jesus is that resurrected man in heaven now. And so we see this first fruits is all about death to life, resurrection. It's all pointing to Christ and his work. So we see that first one. Uh, it's pointing the, the first fruits was for the first fruits of the harvest, the festival. Well, in Christ, we see that he is the first to rise from the dead and to stay alive in a new heavenly body and heavenly experience. There's actually more things that point to Christ. That's a big one. It's all about, it's all about resurrection. But let's see a couple more details that are actually pretty helpful and, and clear in here. Verse 11 of uh, Leviticus chapter 23 says this, On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave the offering. This is an important detail. If we understand that um, what is going on, this, remember this is the third festival, there's the festival of Passover, then unleavened bread the next day, and then sometime in that week there was the feast of, of, of first fruits. There was no actual particular day that the feast first fruits had to be done, it just needed to, in terms of the calendar, like, it, there was a calendar for Passover. There was a calendar day for unleavened bread. But really, what we needed to know for first fruits is that it, just, it had to happen the Sunday, the first day after the Sabbath during that week. And sometimes, because of the calendar, it, it moved around. But look what it said. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. That's exactly what happened in Christ. That the first fruits of God to a new humanity and a new resurrection, he, was, he went to the grave... In fact, did you know Passover was on a Friday, right? That's the day in the, in, back when Jesus died. Passover on, of that week, I believe, I'm trying to remember the date. I think it was April 1st. It might have been April. It, like, we can look back and see which day it was of the calendar. Um, it was a Friday. And the next day is the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. So what happened? Jesus was the Passover lamb who died, who was slain for the, for the sins of the people on Friday. And then what did he do? He rested in the tomb on, on Saturday, what is that a picture of? Sabbath is a picture of rest with God. And what happens the first day after the Sabbath is the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits. Look what it says in Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, no, no coincidence that it says it there, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, that's the first day after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And that's when they saw the empty tomb. And that's where we get our tradition that says, He is risen, He's risen indeed. Why? Because they go to the tomb and they're looking for Jesus. And where is He? And, the, and we see the two men, the, the angels say, He is not here, He is risen. That's where we get that from. 
Good news. He told you that he was going to die and, and rise on the third day. He even says that. Uh, he said he, was, he told you that that was going to happen. He's not here. He is risen. Good news. And so we see that Jesus not only is the first to rise from the dead and to never die again and starting a new humanity and a new race by faith in him, we also see the timing of these details, that it happened the day after the Sabbath is when that took place, the first day of the week, which is why we celebrate uh, we, we do our weekly observance no longer on the seventh day, but we do it on the first day. Why? Because Christ has fulfilled the Saturday Sab- Sabbath, the seventh day, and now we're in a new creation, a new order, and that new order begins anew on the first day of the week. That's why we do this. Let's see another thing in relation, in relation to timing as well. Um, it's not only that it was on the first day after the Sabbath, it's actually that it was the third day. Have you heard um, how there are predictions that on the third day Jesus needed to rise, right? The third day, the third day. Well, let me show you. Jesus talks about that multiple times, and actually Paul says that this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Let me show you again at Luke chapter 24, verse 45 and 46 now. He says, and he opened their minds, Jesus did, to understand the scriptures. And what does he say? And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Jesus said it was written that he needed to suffer and rise on the third day. Do you know off the top of your head what verse he's talking about? Like what verse in the Old Testament said that the Messiah needed to die and needed to rise on the third day? Do you know which verse that is? I had to look that up. Couldn't find one because it's not actually there. It is there, but maybe in a different way. It is there because of this. Look at, look at Paul. He, he backs him up. In, in, in 1 Corinthians, it's actually 15, verses uh, 3 through 4, and he says, uh, First I delivered, for I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Scripture says that the Christ had to die. We see that, Isaiah 53. We see that in, in other places. But, verse 4, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, what? According to the Scriptures. Where are these Scriptures that talk about the third day? Well, actually, the very Scripture we're talking about, the festival of the first fruits, if you do the chronology right, if you understand what's going on in the festival, the first fruits was to be done on the third day. Let me show you the calendar here. Based on the different uh, scriptures that we have from Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and other places, we are told that the tenth day of the month of Nisan is, is the, when you're supposed to choose a Passover lamb, right? You're supposed to make sure it's without spot and without blemish and, pre- and get that lamb prepared for slaughter. Then you're supposed to slaughter. This is when the, fe- the Passover actually begins. This is the first day of the festival, the Passover feast. It's the 14th of Nisan. It's the first day. The ne- very next day is the, f- the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the second day after the festivals have begun. And guess what? After the Festival of, of Unleavened Bread, right in the middle, the next part, the third day, is the offering of the first fruits. So actually what we see here, based on the calendar, is that the first fruits would, was c- associated with a third day. Resurrection is connected to third day. In fact, this is not the only time. If, you, if you're asked, asked the question, where does it say that the third day that it would happen? It's not through a direct uh, uh, prophecy that it must happen in this way. We talked about that if you were with us before. But there are, there are types. There are shadows. Look at, look at how third day in the Old Testament is not just in the festival, but is also associated with death and new life. Look at, uh, right, go back to the creation the creation story, what happens on the third day? First day, he makes light, right? And then the second day, he, he, first day, se- separates light and darkness. Second day, what does he do? The waters from the oceans. What happens on the third day? That's when plant life begins. That's when he makes the vegetation sprout up from the ground. We don't actually get life until the third day. It's just a bare place for two days. Then the third day, we get life. And where did that life come out of? Nothing. Literally, death. There was nothing there. God created life out of death. In fact, he created it out of the ground. In fact, we see it twice. If you look at the the creation story, it's two sets of threes. It's days one, two, three, 
And then the second set is day four, five, six. And those, those sets go together. Day one is connected to day four. Day five is connected to, or day two is connected to five. And day three is connected to six because he, he forms what, the, what they're going to have and then he fills it. So, so look, day six is actually the second, third day. And he says, uh, human is where humans began to sprout <laughs> out of the ground, if you could say it that way. What did he do? He took the dust of the earth and he gave them new life, just like he take out of the ground the vegetation the second, third day. Not only that, Genesis chapter 22 is the story of Isaac. Isaac is Abraham's promised son. And what happened? That was the day. It was on the third day, it says, if you look it up in Genesis 22 verse 4, it was on the third day that Isaac's life was spared. Isaac was as good as dead. Why? Because Abraham was going to pass the test, and he was going to die, and he was going to be a sacrifice as unto the Lord. But what happened? God spared him from death and kept his life going. That happened on the third day. You can see it. And then in Exodus 19, um, when God met with his people on the mountain, you know what he says? What is he going to do? He's actually making a new people. He's making a new, a new nation. And what does he do? You are, I'm taking you out of the land of Egypt. I'm saving you to be a new people. I'm giving you a new life, and I'm going to give you a new covenant. I'm giving you a covenant. And so what happens? That happens on the third day after they arrived at the mountain. This is the third day new life arises from death. God meets with his people. Leviticus, the first fruits. Jonah. Jonah was saved the third day from the belly of the fish. Resurrection from the dead. Third day of the belly of the fish. And Hosea, chapter 6. Israel so clearly has said that Israel was saved out of the exile of their judgment. It says, look to the third day when you will be saved. So we see actually, which, which scriptures? Uh, they were all in shadowy form. They were all in types pointing to that uh, the creation was a type of Christ, that uh, Isaac was a type of Christ, that Israel was a type of Christ, that the first fruits was a type of Christ, that Jonah was a type of Christ. We see it in, in, it's called typological form. There is third day significance to this festival. So we see Christ is risen from the dead. He's ro- he rose the day after the Sabbath, and he rose on the third day. Let's look at one more on how this fulfills um, resurrection. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 14. He says, you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day meaning you can't partake of the harvest until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations with all your dwellings. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, because Christ has, is our first fruits, and now that the offering has been made by the priest, those who are in Christ can now partake. Just like in the, in the first fruits, hey, you can't partake in your harvest until the first fruits happens. Well, there can't be any more resurrected from the dead until Christ happens. And we're told that we actually can participate now that Christ has come. Look what it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then afterward at his coming those who belong to Christ. See, we, as those who have faith in Jesus Christ, will be resurrected as well. In fact, this should be very comforting to us. Those who, we, who understand, we need a new life. We need a new body. We need newness of life. We, if we were to continue in this life, it would only lead us to death and damnation and the rightful judgment of God because of our sin. We need a new life, and that can only happen in Christ. Well, that's now promised to us. It's promised to those who have faith in Christ, not to those who reject Christ, not to those who think they can do whatever they want, not to those people who even say that they are Christians but don't live or act like it. In fact, there's a time in which um, Jesus says very clearly that uh, there are people who will come to him on that day, on the day of judgment, and they will say, Lord, Lord, did not we do uh, many mighty works in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Resurrection unto life is not for those who say that they're with Christ. It's for those who actually die. They die to their old life, their old life of running their life and saying, it's whatever Christ says, whatever Christ wants. I, I'm a sinner. I'm in desperate need of saving. Please forgive me and lead my life from this day forward by faith. We see this illusion happening in the Old Testament that 
the people of God are actually called the first fruits as well. It wasn't just pointing to Christ. It was, but it was pointing to Christ then making a new people. Look at, look at in, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah refers to the Israel as the first fruits. It says in verse 2 of, of chapter 2, I remember the devotion of your youth. He's talking about Israel. Your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. God gave them it took them through the wilderness, and there were people following him. Look, it says, Israel was, the whole, was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. You know, part of the first fruits festival is that you were dedicating this sheep. You were dedicating the first fruits to say, we love you, God. We're going to be holy for you, God. We're going to be different uh, for you, God. And he's saying, yes, when you offer your first fruits, it's a dedication of holiness. And so now you can become holy because you are mine. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 18, says similar things about us being first fruits. It says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, that we should join in the resurrection of life. We would be the first to be a part of what's the new order in Christ. Revelation, our last text for showing this, is Revelation 14, verse 4 and 5. It says, If, if it is these who were not defiled, who have not defiled themselves with women. They are, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Notice what He's talking about. These people are the ones who are pure and who are following Christ. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. It's actually wonderful news that because Christ is the first fruits from the dead, he's the first to resurrect, that all those who have faith and love him and follow him, they become new. They have a new life, and it's a life of holiness. It's a life of, of obedience. It's a life of joyful readiness to follow Christ. And so we see the first fruits. There's actually many more things that point to Christ, but just, just by way of showing it this morning, Christ is the first fruits who rose from the dead. Christ is the one who not only rose from the dead, but he did it on the, on the day after the Sabbath, just as was told. And he did it on the third day, which was, which was showed a, a third day uh, from, from many parts of the Old Testament, and as well as that in him we can be first fruits. And so let me ask you this morning, as we hear this, as we see Christ, as we ponder his goodness and beauty, are you in Christ this morning? Are you in Christ and if you are, are you eagerly waiting for his return in sacrificial holiness? Are you in Christ this morning? Do you have new life? Are you a part of the resurrection? Are you, are you in the new humanity that Christ offers through the new Adam? Or are you are still a part of the old Adam? It only comes through faith in Christ. It only comes through confession of sin. It only comes through death to ourself and life to Christ's self. If you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've not said, Lord, forgive me, help me, make me new, come to him. He offers himself through his sacrifice. Come in faith. Come in humility. And it says, all who come to me I will not cast aside. He is a good God, a good Savior, and he gives grace to the humble. But not only that, if you are this morning, if you are a Christian here this morning and you love Christ, what does the first fruits tell us? What does it help us to understand? Are you a Christian that is eagerly waiting for Christ to come back? Because he, he began a new work in the resurrection. And now that we see this and we, we want this, is this something that you've literally oriented your whole life around? I am so living for Christ that everything I do will be in light of the fact that he's going to judge the whole world when he gets back. Every single word that I say, every single action that I have, every single motive of my heart, spoken and unspoken, do you believe the truth that he's coming back and that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats? And are you saying, I want to be, I want to be with Christ? I, I'm not a slave to this world. I'm not a slave to the things of this world. A love of money, a love of possessions, a love of power, a love of status, a love of control, a love of prestige. No, no, no. Are you saying, I'm living for a different world and a different kingdom? Yes, I'm in this world. 
Yes, I'm not leaving this world until God calls me to the other world, but I am living in this world looking forward to the next. In fact, making all of my decisions based on eternity. Is that true for you? Are you eagerly wanting it? Is, it? is it a part of your regular process? Is it a part of your daily prayers? Lord, come back soon. Make me be prepared. Make me be a person that loves you, that's not in love with other things, that's not an idolater who cares more about the things of life than the things of God. Are you in Christ eagerly waiting for His return? And not only that, in sacrificial holiness. Let me read from Romans chapter 8. Um, we are called to, the, the Spirit of God is placed in us and actually is a picture of that first fruits as well. Uh, Romans 8, 23, it's, it says, not, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, we, we in faith in Christ, we ha- who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Do you think about how you're going to have uh, an eternity with a different body more than this body. I mean, that can actually help out some of our um, esteem, isn't it true? Like, we just can look at our bodies and go, yipes, sometimes. Well, it's not about this world. It's not about this body. It's actually about eternity with Christ. And what, whatever we do in this body should be done for the glory of Christ, should be done for His honor, in His way, at His time, for His glory. And so we eagerly look forward to that. First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, it was read this morning. It says, blessed be, notice the, the tone, notice how he's so excited. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. It, it's not going to be perished at all. It says undefiled, it won't get corrupted unfading. It's not going to diminish in any way at all. It's kept in heaven for you by God's power. We are looking forward to, to meeting God in the future, in heaven, who, who by God's power are being guarded through a faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. If you are in Christ, if you understand the resurrection that Jesus is the first fruits, our life should be lived for heaven's sake. In fact, if you just skip down a few verses in First Peter, he says, since we're so excited and we're so eager for Christ to come back, how should we live? We should live in holiness. It says, verse uh, 13, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Get ready. How should you live here? Not soberly, not, or, or I'm sorry, not with, with, um, without soberness. We are to be sober-minded. He says, no, no, no. Set your hope fully on the grace of that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't, don't look like the way you used to live, like you did in Adam of old. No, no, no. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also, you be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you, sh- you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. I want to close with this passage. It's a passage about the Apostle Paul talking about how he doesn't count this life as anything. In fact, he has many accolades that he could, he could brag about, about his education, about his family, about his occupation. And he says, I just give it all up because I just want to be with Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to be with Christ. I look forward to him. Look what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. This is what he's talking about, dying to self and living to Christ because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Jesus is so much more valuable, so much more worthy, so much more satisfying, so much more lovely than anything I can experience on this earth. Do you know him? Have you you seen him? Have you experienced the sweetness of Christ that we see so clearly here in Paul? He says, "For for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. 
It says, and, 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 and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. It's not, my obedience does not, does not buy me into heaven. No, my obedience is because I love the Lord. I want to be with him. My righteousness is from Christ. It's not from me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Brothers and sisters, friends, Christ is our only hope. And we here this morning, like with many others, are celebrating the resurrection of Christ because that is the entrance into a new life, a life of forgiveness, a life of joy, a life of devotion to God, a life according to his plan for his glory, we can have our souls satisfied in him. And so I'd like to ask you to please bow your heads as I pray. And I wanted to pray um, the words of a, of a prayer that was given um, by one of the Puritans on the resurrection, a prayer of gratefulness and a prayer of expectation. So would you bow with me? O oh God of my exodus, Great was the joy of Israel's sons when Egypt died upon the shore. Far greater the joy when the Redeemer's foe laid crushed in the dust. Jesus strides forth as the victor, conqueror of death and hell and all opposing might. He bursts the bands of death. He tramples the powers of darkness down, and he lives forever. He is my, he is our gracious surety. He took the payment for my debt. He comes forth from the prison house of the grave, and he comes out free, the triumphant one over sin, over Satan, and over death. Lord, please show me, please show us the proof that his vicarious offering is accepted, that the claims of justice have been satisfied, that the devil's scepter has been shriveled, that his wrongful throne has been leveled. Give me the assurance that in Christ I died and that in him I rise. And in his life I live. In his victory I triumph. In his ascension I shall be glorified with him. Adorable Redeemer, you were lifted up upon a cross and you have ascended to the highest heaven. You, who was the man of sorrows, was crowned with thorns and now you are the Lord of life, wreathed with glory. Once, no shame more deep than yours, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel. Now, no exaltation more high, no life more glorious, no advocate more effective. You are in the triumph car, leading captive your enemies behind you. And what more could be done than what you have already done? Your death is my life, your resurrection is my peace, your ascension is my hope, and your prayers are my comfort. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the first fruits. We thank you that you give us so much hope because you are the first, Lord, and in you and in you alone, we can have new life, forgiveness of sins. We can have our souls satisfied. Lord, please call us to yourself once again so that we can follow you in grace and in hope and in love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.